Hello, hi everybody, how you doing? My name is Dan, I'm the Jazz Shepherd. <coughs> this is from my favorite hockey tournament as a child, Canada Cup, 87-91, against the Soviets, those were special times. Part of the healing of the Cold War on an international perspective. Boys will be boys. But, uh, doing the vinyl tag thing, where we talk about 20 different subjects real quickly. And uh, I'm going to change a few things here just because it's my channel. I'm not really doing that. Uh, the first question was best finds of 2019. And I had two choices here. One is in the wild find in stores. And the second one was an online find. I'm going to start with the uh, in-store find. And it's an Oscar Peterson 10 inch from probably 1953. And uh, his singing on this it's one of the rare cases where he sings. Uh, I guess him and Nat Cole came into an agreement after this that he'd stick to piano and Nat would stick to singing. And he doesn't sing again on a record till Nat dies doing a tribute record to Nat. But all that aside, which is interesting in and of itself, he has a beautiful voice and his versions of I Can't Give You Any But Love, the things we did last summer, Autumn in New York, I'm Glad There Is You. Uh, every song on here, it just requires multiple listenings just to soak it in. It's just gorgeous. So I can't recommend that enough to people, unless it's not the easiest thing to come by, of course. <clears throat> My second uh, best find of 2019 was a record I looked at for a long time. I've been trying to complete the Bethlehem 10-inch series. This is the Charlie Mariana with a kind of x-ray vision of a saxophone. Uh, this record's not cheap. It's usually in the $100 to $200 to $400 range. Old 10-inch from 54. Uh, great group on here with the Williamsons and... Trevor was on the trumpet. Yeah, Stu Williamson, Cla Claude's on piano, Frank Rosalino, Max Bender, Steve Levy, Stan Levy, sorry. So it's like just as solid as Bethlehem series sessions get. It was always kind of eluding me. I couldn't quite win at an auction ever, and I finally tracked one down for a fairly decent price. So that's what you find of 2019 that I'm, of many, you know. Secondly, my favorite album of 2019. Uh, it's a pretty limited scope for me. I'm an old school guy. My music is mostly old jazz, uh, <clears throat> old funk, old soul, old hip hop. You know, I'm, I'm stuck in the old days, <clears throat> but I still have a lot of current music. You know what I mean? But a lot of it's on vinyl, uh, and a lot of it, I'm not that impressed with when I buy it. To be honest, you know, I'm not gonna hear a lot of record I thought was inconsistent and kind of weak. Had, had one good song on it. Uh, this record though, me and my kids grew to it all summer. Uh, Khalid, Free Spirit, and I can honestly say DJing my Saturday brunch gig, I probably played nine songs from this record. They're all real modern in terms of the percussion and the subs and the, how it hits in the, in the bar, but it's got a real classic soul in terms of D'Angelo, kind of a ghetto soul, you know, going back to that. Uh, Bad luck, my bad, better talk, right back, don't pretend, paradise. Really, it's like from front to back, it's a really solid record. And it's not pretentious, it's not full of cursing and n-words. It's <clears throat> innocence, loss of a 20-year-old black male. And uh, it's an honest expression of that. And great production, all coupled together to make this my favorite record of 2019. <clears throat> Number three, they asked for a novelty record. And... Uh, could have gone a lot of different directions with this, but I went with one of my favorites. This is tough to find. The Neil Hefty Batman record. Of course, it's from the cartoon series of the 60s. It has a second uh, chapter to it that came out. And there's a song on here. I believe it's called Senorita Boobam, perhaps. I got to look at the vinyl itself. It's just fantastic. Uh... <clears throat> Yeah, I think it's in your ear, boom, bam. Um, it's the show. It's fun, 60s mod with a little bit of R&B in there, a uh, little bit of theatrical sounds and orchestral arrangements at times, but it's, it's fun stuff. <clears throat> it's Scooby-Doo and Acid. So I, I always love to play these once in a while at the bar, drop a song in. It just feels fun. 
And there's actually some Budos band tracks that fit pretty good with some of that Neil Hefty stuff. <clears throat> so that's my novelty choice for number three. For number four, I was looking for an homage cover. And of course, Blue Note album cover has been bit numerous times. But I just didn't want to do the Mad Lib record doing an old Blue Note album cover. You know, it's kind of obvious. So I went with something a little different on this one. <clears throat> I went with a Marvin Gaye record where he's mimicking the game of life. On the front is the institution of marriage. On the back is the end results of marriage. On the inside is the board game of life with all its pitfalls and troubles and trials and tribulations. Uh, not only is this record have an incredible story behind it, it's also one of the most soulful, painful records in Motown's discography. He had just gone through a really ugly divorce, which turns out most of them are, and uh, the judge had ordered him to give her all the royalties from his next two records. Ouch! And he was not thrilled about it, of course, and so he made a double record to get her paid off in one lump sum about how much of a fucking bitch she is. And uh, here, my dear Sparrow, I met a little girl. When did you stop loving me? When did I stop loving you? Anger, is that enough? Google, is that enough? Play that and see how perfect that R&B is. That's timeless stuff, man. Uh, and a song, one day again, they, they refrain instrumental, a funky space reincarnation. It wasn't a record full of hits, but it was a record full of honest sorrow and anger and pain. And he's got the greatest voice and soul possibly of anybody ever and so to hear that pain coming through with that voice it's just a record you'll play time and time again and <clears throat> people will come over and be moved by it but not know it be like what is that that's cool what is that Marvin Gaye's here my dear timeless record and uh, homage to the institution of marriage so again I'm gonna go in my own direction on some of these questions because <clears throat> so I can <clears throat> so now we're on to the B side, uh, records with deep tracks. And I, I have two choices here once again. Thievery Corp, a group I've followed since the late 90s out of DC. Uh, they've kind of done a dub, electronic down tempo vibe most of these years. Uh, you couldn't be in a lounge, cafe, bar in the early thousands and not be hearing Richest Man in Babylon, Mirror Conspiracy. Some of those records were pretty seminal in that lounge down tempo scene. But they've still been at it, and they started getting more reggae dub and straight reggae into their sound as they went forward and started working with more of the Caribbean guys and the African guys, in part because they also had a really socially conscious message, and to talk with people and work with people who actually came from that oppression legitimizes some of what they're trying to do coming from a kind of bourgeoisie to Washington, D.C. And so they, they bring in these artists that are just powerful and honest and show a lot of pain. And so this record that they put out probably two years ago now, uh, The Temple of I and I, I really haven't gotten sick of it. Uh, it talks about guns, it talks about violence, it talks about poverty, it talks about the politics of, and the media and corporations. It's really a powerful political social statement with a lot of interesting voices telling you their perspective. Uh, I don't find it to be preachy, just informative. Uh, and the production is immaculate, which of course is a hallmark of Down Tempo and especially Thievery Corporation. Uh, it's just a really, really solid record from front to back. And I honestly say, for a group that's not technically a reggae group, it's my favorite reggae album from the last 10 years, in part because the production values are so high. So you can play it in any set and it's not going to have a lower quality sound. <coughs> it's going to be just full, luxurious, and as, as velvety as the Phil, Velvet Underground, I mean, Fabry Corbels was. Uh, my second choice for a deep record is this Alina Baraz, Gala Matias, Urban Flora LP. Uh, it's kind of an electric synth pop uh, with some kind of, kind of trap, uh, garage, UK garage beats behind it. So it's got a real modern club feel with, with the trap beats under it. But it's got a real, almost a Depeche Mode, dreamscape, uh, luxurious sound to the tracks themselves. She's got a nice voice. Uh, I think on this album, I can say I've probably played every track in the bar. It's eight songs, nice clear vinyl. 
I think I've played every track on there numerous times and songs like Maybe, if you want to Google Maybe, what a great song that is. I've played that probably a hundred times. So great record, Urban Flora, Paul Matias, uh, Alana Baraz. <coughs> so now on the next question, number six, Funky. There's only one answer to this question. Anybody puts anything else is wrong. This man is the funk. James Brown is the architect, the designer. He built the motherfucking house. You stand on this alone. Everything that's funky came from this. Funk doesn't really exist before this. And funk can not be busy. Funk cannot be four people speaking at the same time. Funk needs space. The volume will fill the space. It needs to breathe, it needs to have that open room between beats and grooves. And then when that guitar drops out one thing in there and the bass puts its little thing and the drums are doing its pattern, it repeats and becomes a loop, which is the seminal principle behind all hip hop and R&B. <clears throat> Everything we've listened to the last 40 years, he is the architect behind it. Jazz wasn't a straightforward groove. Soul was very rhythmless in the early 70s. When you listen to stuff like the Stylistics and the Delphonics, there's not a lot of groove behind that. When you put James Brown on, I feel good is still the tempo. It's still the template for everything. And so to say anything else was funk, it would be a descendant of this, and you might as well just go to the source. Question number seven. Weird shelf partners. <clears throat> a lot of my records don't get shelved very often because I'm changing my crates for my gigs all the time. But these two have ended up next to each other consistently. And I just like the juxtaposition of it. And we got Billie Eilish, teen angst, the pain, the suffering of being a white American. It's a tough life. I find this a little bit over, uh, over imaged. You know, there's some regret to her for sure. I like the record. But there's a lot of Marilyn Manson, Alice Cooper kind of presentation to it, which doesn't know send the test of time very well. And the first time you see him at an award show in a regular outfit, you're like, oh, all that character is an act. Uh, and then she's often ends up Eilish next to Ed. And I'm not ashamed to say I love Ed and Sharon. Uh, he's a great thing for me to play at the club, but I want that moment to get everyone singing, all the girls participating, go, oh, you're a great DJ, we love you because I played some Ed Sheeran for him and everyone was drunk and sang to it. So Ed and Eilish, it's a pretty weird little bad fellow, I would have to suggest. Um, I was there. <clears throat> I was very honored and privileged to have the fortune of seeing the great Lou Donaldson at the Dakota Jazz Bar, downtown Minneapolis, probably almost 10 years ago now, maybe more. Uh, he actually signed the record for me. And he had a little bit of tear in his eyes because he I, I brought probably five of his records in for him to look at. And he said he hadn't touched the vinyl in 40 years. He hadn't seen one of his albums in 40 years. And I had a great time chatting with him for five, ten minutes. He was super friendly guy. He was in his 80s, probably late 80s, and he could still rip through the changes of Cherokee and uh, play blues walk. He, it was fantastic. Uh, he had a little Japanese girl on the organ. Uh, it was soul, kitchen. R&B based blues a lot of the night, but there was some still hard bop and bebop in there mixed in. I love Lou. Lou doesn't get the credit he deserves. He made a lot of great records on Blue Note, so I enjoyed seeing him. <clears throat> Next question, number uh, nine. Which record do you wish you had an original copy of? And this was a tough one for me. I'm a huge jazz guy. I got 4,000 jazz albums back there, 12,000 in my whole collection. And I have a lot of original pressings, and I'm not super motivated by having that original pressing. So I just limited it down to what's my favorite record. And again, that's a tough thing to narrow down, but the song Idle Moments by Grant Green, for me, it's a perfect headspace. It's a 12, 30 minute song. If I had to play one song over for a day, it'd probably be that. It's just the blues, uh, <clears throat> all four soloists, uh, the fantastic Joe Henderson on the saxophone, uh, the fantastic Duke Pearson on piano, of course, Grant Green on guitar, and then Bobby Hutcherson on the vibes. They all play these wonderful, eloquent, dreamy, idle moment type solos that I can just get stuck in and be happy to be there. Duke Pearson's a fantastic pianist. Some of his coloring in the beginning of the song sucks you in right there. You're like, that's just so elegant. And the elegance of these black men was proving a point. We aren't three-fifths human beings. We are sophisticated. 
you're going to leave my show impressed by how we play these instruments. And uh, Grand, Grand Green Isle Moments, you can't go wrong with that. The song was never meant to be that long, but when the song started, they ended up doing double time in, the, in, the, in, the, in their solos, and everyone else just kind of followed suit, and the song ended up being 14 minutes. No one stopped it because the take was so great. Uh, Idle Moments can't go wrong. I'd love to find the original one someday. <laughs> Uh, a complete discography, and I could have done a lot of things here from Bob Dylan to Miles Davis, but that's 70 records. Um, I have a lot of complete discography, that's kind of how I like to operate. I like to get to know an artist before I feel like I can have an opinion about him too strongly. I certainly don't want to say I have knowledge about something that I don't know much about. So I always try to limit that to what I do know. And I'm going to show you a group I didn't pull every record by. But I pulled uh, just enough to kind of drive this home. Um, Ohio players have a series of incredible album covers. And I've often said they're the greatest funk band that most white people don't know about. They probably heard Love Roller Coaster. They've probably heard uh, Fire. But they probably couldn't tell you who did those songs. <clears throat> it's Ohio players. And these album covers have a great duality to them. Uh, it's a thing of beauty, but now it becomes a social, political statement. And they use sex and nudity in a way that's really quite powerful. I'm gonna show you their westbound stuff. Guess I can't do it that way. That's uh. A lot of really cool album covers. The Westbound Years. A lot of these, when you fold them up, there's kind of a sensual picture of a woman on the front. And then they end up becoming uh, kind of a political statement of oppression on the back. And when art has a duality to it, it's al almost always powerful in that context. I got, of course, <clears throat> highlight the album Honey which had the great album cover, but on the inside, it really topped itself with that. And I don't think there's a whole lot of kids that didn't have that glued to their wall in the 70s, if your mom let you. <clears throat> I'm just gonna switch the record real quick here. Okay, so on to the second part of this.